Right at the end of Mark's Gospel, Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the world and preach the Gospel. This command of Jesus has a special name. It's called the Great Commission, meaning it's the most important job that Jesus left for all of us to do after he ascended into heaven. It's our occupation now. Go into all the world and let people everywhere know what it was that Jesus taught. He told his disciples something that they have passed on to us and that he wants us to pass on to the rest of the world. But almost immediately after Jesus said this, there was a mix-up. A bit like the parable where Jesus says that he sowed good seed in a field. And the same night after he sowed the seed, his enemy came in and sowed a different seed. It was a special seed that looked a lot like the real thing, except it did not produce any fruit. It was essentially a weed. Well, that's what happened with the Great Commission, right from the start. The first Christians got it wrong. Only slightly, but still, they got it wrong. Am I saying that Jesus failed? That he started something that totally flopped? No, not at all. It was all part of the plan. He let the deception slip in right from the start, and he did it for a very special reason. He wanted to see how many of us would follow him and how many of us would follow a slightly imperfect imitation of him. It was a little trick built into the gospel. And that trick is called water baptism. All over the world, churches of all shapes and sizes teach people to be baptized in water. It's hard to get two of them to agree on exactly how it's supposed to be done, whether you baptize in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Whether you sprinkle or pour water on people or whether you dunk them in the water. Whether it's done in a pool inside a church or in a river. Who does it? And what the person doing it needs to believe in order for it to be valid. Whether you tip the person backwards or whether you tip them forward when putting them under the water. How old the person needs to be before you can baptize them. What to do if the person backslides after being baptized. Whether the Holy Spirit comes into a person before, during, or after the water baptism. The list goes on and on. Honestly, there have been more divisions in the church over water baptism than over any other teaching in the Bible or out of it. Now, the Apostle Paul gets some pretty heavy criticism at times, but he's actually the first person to have seen through this confusion to the truth behind it. In the first chapter of his first letter to the church at Corinth, Paul addresses the problem. He says that people were arguing over who baptized them. Like it was really special to have been baptized by Peter, or by Paul, or by someone called Apollos. And he admits that he did baptize a small handful of people before he realized something quite radical at the time, and still radical today. What was it that he realized? he realized that Jesus never meant for us to baptize people in water. Let's read it here. Christ did not call me to baptize, that is with water, but to preach the gospel. Wow, what a radical thing to say. I'll bet you never heard them preach that in your church before, have you? Paul had discovered something that I want to show you in this video. Something that has been screwed up and distorted way out of proportion right from the start of Christianity down to this present day. And something which should cause us to take a lot more seriously the instruction to follow Jesus and not to follow followers of Jesus. I'll start by saying straight out that the disciples of Jesus did baptize people in water. I know that and I accept that both before the death and after the resurrection of Jesus. I'm not arguing about that. It's clearly stated in the Gospels, and it's clearly stated in the book of Acts that they baptized people with water. Yet when you read all the teachings of Jesus, you get the feeling that this little ritual, which has characterized institutional Christianity ever since the day of Pentecost, is glaringly 
inconsistent with the spirit of everything else that Jesus taught. He already had a ritual, if it was a ritual he wanted. He could tell the good guys from the bad guys through something called circumcision. And circumcision was instituted by God. The trouble is that most of Jesus' worst enemies were circumcised. And I'm afraid that most of his worst enemies today have also been baptized in water. It's as easy to fake one ritual as it is to fake the other. I'm not saying that either ritual was bad in itself. I was baptized when I was about 10 years old. Most of the people I work with were baptized at some time in their life before they discovered the teachings of Jesus. It won't hurt anyone to be baptized in water. In fact, if you have any doubts about being water baptized, after you've listened to this video, then go on out and find yourself someone and get done, just to be safe if you like. But believe me, there's something far more satisfying than being dunked in water. And that's what I want you to discover by listening to this video, just as Paul discovered it. It's a great Old Testament scripture that is quoted in the New Testament, which relates well to what I'm saying. It says, I want obedience more than sacrifice. What God was saying is that he wants us to be open to what he is telling us to do right now more than he wants us performing religious rituals. Now, the first thing a religious person will say in response to that is that their rituals are proof of their obedience, that God told them to do the rituals or to perform the sacrifices. You take traditional Baptist teaching, for example. 51 weeks out of the year, they'll tell you, you don't have to obey Jesus to be saved. Jesus did it all for you. Trying to obey Jesus, well, that amounts to trying to work your way to heaven, which everyone knows is the worst thing in the world that anyone could possibly be guilty of. But then, on the one week in a year, roughly, that they baptize someone, it all changes. The word obedience is sprinkled all through the whole baptism ritual. Any of you Baptists out there would probably have heard the phrase about following our Lord in obedience through the waters of baptism. It's the only thing you are allowed to do in a Baptist church without a worry in the world as to whether or not you might be trying to work your way to heaven. And in response, Jesus says, what I want is real obedience, not water baptism. Sure, sacrifices were described in great detail in the Torah, the Law of Moses. But even in the Old Testament, it seems that Yahweh left the Torah incomplete. He had let a little weed get planted there that he was eventually going to have to rip out. And he was going to send his son to do it. Jesus came to replace, to fulfill, to render useless, if you like, the law of Moses, in an effort to introduce the human race to the perfect and final will of God. But still, even today, people run after Moses in preference to Jesus, just as they run after the apostles in preference to Jesus. Look at what John wrote in the fourth chapter of his gospel. Jesus baptized not, but his disciples baptized. That's it. That's all we're told about Jesus and water baptism. Jesus did not do it, but his disciples did. It leaves some very important unanswered questions. What specifically were his disciples doing, and why were they doing it? And why wasn't Jesus doing it? Have you ever questioned why Jesus himself was baptized in water by John the Baptist? When Jesus was the perfect, spotless Lamb of God, he didn't need his sins washed away. He didn't need to die to his flesh. He didn't need a turning point between when he was a sinner and when he became a Christian. And yet his baptism was a turning point. The end of the old and the start of the new. Listen to Jesus himself describing it. The law and the prophets were until John. But since John, the kingdom of heaven is preached. And he that is least and the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. When Jesus was baptized by John, why did John protest? John said, you're the one who should be baptizing me. Jesus didn't need to be baptized. John knew that. Baptism was a Jewish ritual, occasionally practiced by Nazarite priests. These were kind of freestyle priests who were not from the priestly tribe of Levi. And baptism was a symbol of a change, 
a desire to get back on the rails spiritually. But it was, above all, a Hebrew practice, a Hebrew ritual. There was nothing uniquely Christian about water baptism. So Jesus says to John, when John asks him why he's getting baptized, it makes sense, he says, for me to fulfill all righteousness. What does that mean? Well, he was born into a Jewish family. He was circumcised eight days after he was born, taken to the temple when he was 12, raised in all the disciplines of the Jewish religion. And now he does this one final Jewish ritual, marking the end of his Jewishness and the start of a whole new religion. Well, technically not a new religion, but a deeper revelation of what had been the true invisible religion of God throughout the entire history of the kingdom of Israel and long before the Hebrew religion. Righteousness had never been about the visible kingdom of Israel. That was just an imperfect vessel through which to discover this inner, almost secret world of God for a time. John knew that. He explained it as clearly as anyone could have ever explained it. He said, I indeed baptize with water. But there comes one mightier than I, and he will baptize you. But will it be with water? No, of course not. Water was the old way of doing it. So what would this Messiah replace John's Jewish baptism with? He, says John, will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Yes, the Holy Ghost. This mysterious power of the new kingdom has been lost in a pool of lukewarm water. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, There's only one Lord, there's only one faith, and there is only one baptism. And that baptism is with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of Jesus, which is available to us all now, and which was first poured out on the day of Pentecost. The physical body of Jesus is no longer here with us, but we have his spirit now, or his ghost, if you prefer. But even there, a huge mistake was made. On the day of Pentecost, and in a couple of instances after that, when people spoke in tongues, the apostles assumed that the two were synonymous. Speaking in tongues and the Holy Spirit. It seemed a reasonable assumption, until you compared it with the teachings of Jesus. If that was what it was all leading up to, then why hadn't Jesus taught that? Why didn't he tell us that talking in tongues would be the proof that someone has his spirit? Once again, it was the Apostle Paul, born out of season, as he put it, never having seen Jesus in the flesh, like the other disciples, who actually saw through the false assumption. He wrote to the Corinthians, who had accepted the tongues assumption along with the water baptism assumption and he had the courage to say if you talk in tongues and you do not have love what have you got all you have is a lot of noise a sounding gong and a tinkling cymbal all through history god's been doing it that way stepping over the obvious air to put his blessing on a supplanter a replacement born out of season. The so-called children of the kingdom are dumped along the way so that foreigners of every sort can come and inherit the kingdom instead. A Syrophoenician woman, tax collectors, a Roman centurion, despised Samaritans, uncircumcised, unbaptized upstarts are brought in from the highways and the byways of the world as God continually tries to drive home to us that we don't make the rules. He makes them, and he can change them if he chooses. Damn your Torah worship. Damn your Paul worship. Damn your doctrines about baptism and speaking in tongues. Let the Son of God be heard. Unloose him. And let the kingdom of heaven be seen in all its glory, in everything that he taught and did. Ah, but what about the Great Commission, you might ask. Doesn't it mention water baptism? Isn't it right there, right in the Gospels? Now what about speaking in tongues? Isn't that there in the Great Commission as Mark records it? No, not necessarily. And that's why I've entitled this video, The Most 
misunderstood teaching of Jesus. I'll say just a little bit about the passage in Mark at the very end, but my primary focus right now is the reference to baptism in Matthew 28. To understand what Jesus actually said, we need to listen a whole lot more carefully. False assumptions most often spring from reading the Bible lazily. Like people do with the word believe in John 3.16. Well, he skipped right over it like it doesn't exist. Well, something similar happens in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Only in this case, we add a word that's not there. Water. Yes, the apostles themselves assumed that Jesus meant water. They went off dunking people wherever they went. Even Paul thought that for a little while. But then God opened his eyes. Here it is, the Great Commission, as recorded in Matthew's Gospel. I want you to look at this passage very closely and tell me how many things did Jesus tell his disciples to do. For those of you who have some trouble with English grammar, and I think most of us do, we're looking for verbs in this sentence, what I like to call action words. Let's highlight them here. Go, that's an action. Preach, that's an action. Baptizing, teaching. Four action words. So, how many things did Jesus tell us to do in his Great Commission? Did I hear you say four? See, that's the assumption that many of us make on spotting four apparent verbs. If I tell you, go, that's a command, isn't it? Easily understood by everyone. If I tell you, preach, that too is a command. Also easily understood. So, we all agree that Jesus at least told us to do two things go and preach. But what if I tell you baptizing? Doesn't make sense, does it? If I tell you teaching, that doesn't make sense either. You wouldn't say it like that. Why are these words written differently? I'm going to use some other verbs instead to illustrate what's being said here. If I say go and pay the bill, clearing my debt and using the money I gave you earlier. Again, we have four action words in the command. Go, pay, clearing, and using. But are they really four different actions as you picture them in your mind? Can you see how adding ing shows that clearing and using just describe one, the result of you paying the bill, it clears the debt, and the means through which you will pay it. You'll use the money I gave you to pay it. So let's go back to what Jesus said in his Great Commission. Ask yourself if it's possible that he was saying that if you preach the gospel, the result will be that people will have been baptized in God's Spirit. And is it possible that the way you preach the gospel would be by teaching people to do everything that Jesus told you to do? Now, we may not like it, but at least that second phrase, teaching them to observe everything I've told you to do, is probably quite reasonable. Preach the gospel teaching them in the process to observe everything I've commanded you to do. That's how we should be preaching the gospel. Of course, it's not being preached that way today. But certainly, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John believed that they were preaching the gospel when they wrote their books. They called them the gospel. And this was many years after Paul had died. The gospel, according to these four men, contained everything they could remember of what Jesus had told them to do. But what about the baptism part of the Great Commission? How can you baptize someone with water or with the Holy Spirit just by preaching the gospel? Well, first, let's look at something else that Jesus said in the sixth chapter of John's gospel. He says, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In other words, the things that Jesus had said, what he taught, is his true Holy Spirit. You cannot know the Holy Spirit of Jesus without hearing the words that he spoke. Suppose I asked you to describe John Wesley to me without telling me anything that he taught, anything that he said, or anything that he believed. The very best you could do would be to describe his facial features, his bodily movements, the kind of clothes he wore, his peculiar mannerisms, that sort of thing. In the end, however, he would still be little more than one face in a world full of different faces. I would not know him. I would not know his spirit. 
You might also tell me his name and his ancestry. But unless we examine what a person says and believes, we don't know the person just through a name and ancestry. And that's why so few people in the churches today know the real Jesus of the Bible. They know his name and they know his ancestry, but they have never met the real man. And because of that, they do not and they cannot have his spirit. But if I preach the gospel to you, teaching you everything that Jesus has told me, one of his followers, to do, I am covering you with his spirit. I am immersing you in his spirit. I am baptizing you in his spirit. The word baptize means cover or immerse. The more I preach to you, teaching you everything he's told me to do, the more of his spirit I'm giving to you. But, of course, if you don't receive what I'm saying, my efforts are wasted. You must believe or drink in, which is what the word believe means, literally. You need to drink in what I'm spraying over you through my words. And you will be filled with, covered with, immersed in the Holy Spirit of Jesus. So, when does a person receive the Holy Spirit? Well, they receive the Holy Spirit every time they believe something he has said. It's not a one-off experience. It's ongoing. Some of you are receiving the Holy Spirit right now, even as I speak. And you will continue to receive the Holy Spirit as long as you keep drinking in the teachings of Jesus, whether they come through me or through your own reading of his teachings in the Bible. Unfortunately, no one is being taught to believe the teachings of Jesus in the churches today because no one is being told the teachings of Jesus. We've got no idea about who he really is. Like I said earlier, the disciples themselves made false assumptions in the book of Acts. God let that happen. I don't think they went to hell for making those false assumptions. But we will go to hell if we have a choice between the truth and those false assumptions and we still hide behind the false assumptions. The Holy Spirit is not visible like water. It's not an all or nothing experience like speaking in tongues. Jesus said to Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it's coming from or where it's going. This is how it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So you cannot put the wind in a box. When you do that, it ceases to be wind. The words wind and spirit come from the same root word. And so you cannot put the spirit into a box either. It ceases to have the freedom to blow as God wishes. Yet religions everywhere invariably try to box up God. They try to turn God's revelation to mankind into a ritual. Or they try to replace it with one. So, do you understand the Great Commission better now? Jesus has instructed me, and by that he has instructed you, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We do it by teaching people to obey everything he's told us to do. And when we do that, we cover people with the Holy Spirit of Jesus, empowering them to go into all the world and preach the gospel as well. His final words to his disciples before ascending into heaven were that the Holy Spirit would empower them to go and preach to others what they themselves had been told by Jesus. Now, just one final comment about that reference to speaking in tongues at the end of Mark's Gospel. It's the only reference to tongues in all of the Gospels. Now, that seems a bit strange in itself, doesn't it? However, in recent years, earlier manuscripts of Mark's Gospel have been found. And that passage about drinking poison and picking up snakes and speaking in tongues, it does not appear in them. All the evidence shows that they were added later. Most modern translations make that clear. This is not something I've made up. What seems most likely to me is that the false assumption the apostles made about speaking in tongues being the evidence that someone has God's Spirit led someone to insert that passage into later copies of Mark's Gospel with good intentions, but not in accord with anything that Jesus actually said. So with that, and with all that I've said in this video, I baptize you 
in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.